Hello, and welcome to the CTRC's Telehealth Summit webinar series. My name is Kathy Chorba. I'm the Executive Director of the California Telehealth Resource Center. It is my pleasure today to introduce Doris Barta and Jordan Berg, who are our colleagues from the Telehealth Technology Assessment Center, which is the National Telehealth Resource Center for Technology. Doris and Jordan have agreed to join us today to speak about and demonstrate some up and coming telehealth technologies and to facilitate a very robust Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So before we get started, I'd like to remind you of a few logistics. First thing is all the attendees are in listen only mode, so you can feel free to open up your bags of potato chips and, and eat your lunch while you're watching this demonstration. Please use the Q&A functions on Zoom for questions and comments for speakers. You can use the chat on Zoom for uh, just things like tech, tech, technical questions, like you can't hear the audio or you can't see the video. And this uh, session is being recorded, so your attendance is consent to be recorded. And of course, the recording the presentation slides from this presentation and the session will be made available at the end of this week for you and your colleagues to take a look at at your convenience. So I'll just hand this over to Doris and Jordan to get started and thank you both for joining us today. Thank you, Kathy, for that nice introduction. Um, Jordan and I are pleased to be able to do the virtual technology showcase for you today. Now, usually we are physically there with all of you to do the showcase, but unfortunately this is an interesting year and so we have adapted our showcase to do a virtual showcase for you so <clears throat> just a little bit about who we are as kathy said we're the nationally funded telehealth technology assessment center i'm the director of ttac jordan is a technology specialist for ttac and we provide technology assessment services to the 12 regional telehealth resource centers, as well as the other national TRC. We have three staff. We have myself, Jordan, and Garrett. Garrett is currently using a mobile technology device to look into Garrett, to Jordan's eye in this picture. And between the three of us, we have over 50 years experience in telehealth. So the technology showcases, usually, as I said, we bring all this equipment with us to conferences so that we give you an opportunity to look at the equipment and, and use equipment side by side so you can give your own assessment of the, of the technology. Gives you an opportunity to experience the technology in a view, vendor new, neutral environment because we don't promote any one technology. So TTAC is a member of the National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers. As I said earlier, there are 14 of us, and we all contribute to the National Telehealth website, where there's an abundance of information about technology. So um, please take some time to take a look at that website. It's www.telehealthresourcecenter.org. And this is an actual uh, uh, interactive map that's on that website. And so if you're looking for your TRC, for example, the California TRC, all you would have to do is click on California and it would bring you to a contact sheet for you to access Kathy and, and uh, Rebecca and Aislinn so that they can help you with whatever your needs are. If you want to access one of the two national TRCs, then you just click on their logo and that will direct you to one of those two TRCs. So what are we going to be talking with you about today? We want to focus on technology and its relationship to the COVID crisis and how that has influenced the trends in platform uses for providing telemedicine care. We will share with you some key results of a recent web-based video platform assessment that we did. We will provide a live demonstration on some video and audio solutions. We'll, we will discuss the features of three exam cameras and we'll provide video demonstration clips. We will also talk with you about electronic stethoscopes and their use in virtual care. We will demonstrate how mobile health or mHealth peripherals 
are changing how telemedicine is provided, especially in the direct-to-consumer telemedicine. And finally, we will leave you with some thoughts about technology and telemedicine before we answer your questions. So what we have seen in the telemedicine world, the, the COVID-19 crisis has been both a disrupting and reinforcing force in the telemedicine market. Now, Jordan and I are sure that you're not surprised at the, at the amount of interest in tele, telehealth that this has created, but it has increased significantly since this crisis began. Organizations are wanting to get telemedicine functionality up in their offices as quickly as possible. And there is an increase in interest in reaching the patient in their home environment. I was talking with a friend of mine the other day and he told me that 100% of their pediatric providers are doing telehealth now and 99% of their adult providers are doing telehealth. So they went from 1,200 clinical encounters a month to 44,000 clinical encounters a month. So you can see the significant increase in the use of telehealth. This is just one person. We hear the same story over and over and over again. So the, the world of telehealth has just exploded in the last six months. So specifically for video-based telemedicine, here are a few key features that should be considered in your selection process and key concerns that need to be addressed or at least understood. So with regard to the key features, web-based. <clears throat> COVID-19 has moved many programs from web-based video platforms because they can be set up quickly. While this is not a new trend, we have been tracking this for a while, but we've really seen an acceleration in the pace of people using this type of technology. The same with directed to patient. The biggest changes that we are seeing is a rapid use of patient home as a care location. This means that we are using the patient's equipment, such as their tablet, their smartphone, their consumer grade Wi-Fi and mobile networks. It also means that the platforms that can connect the patients are using simple connection methodologies like email, text message, or through a patient portal. To that end, we are seeing a lot more patients and providers expressing an interest in solutions that they can operate without the patient having to download a desktop application or create a mobile app in their account. And with mobile platforms, there has been a significant growth in organizations seeking mobile platforms for the delivery of care. This can include using technology to design to be used on a tablet or a cell phone. And we will demonstrate for you an ultrasound device that is a mobile platform that uses a, a tablet to show the image capture. And so what are some of the key concerns? COVID-19 has served as a stress test that telemedicine capability of organizations, services, and vendors. It has made us focus on several key features that are necessary for rapidly deployed or rapidly scaled service. <clears throat> so with regard to deployability, how quickly can a new service or expanded service be deployed into a clinical environment? If you purchase a new platform or device, how soon will you be able to use it in providing patient care? Scalability, how rapidly can you move from seeing a dozen patients a, a, a week to hundreds of patients a week? Does your network support this spike in traffic? Do you have enough software licenses to cover the spike in demand? Reliability, if you get a new service or device, how reliable will it be for actual patient care over time? and ease of use. In addition to all of this, there are many more providers and patients using these technologies, some who have never considered using telehealth before. So having a product that is simple to use and easy to train on is vital in delivering care that doesn't get bogged down by technology issues. And in the middle of all of that, we constantly need to be thinking about security and privacy in telemedicine. 
we are seeing two forces that are affecting security and privacy during the COVID-19 crisis. One is a relaxation of some of the HIPAA compliance and other regulations around platforms that can be used in delivering patient care. This has allowed clinicians and patients to connect and be reimbursed using non-traditional technologies. Now, the Office of Civil Rights has published a notice about these types of technologies that are and are not appropriate for patient care. They have specifically mentioned FaceTime, Facebook Messenger, video chat, Google Hangout, Zoom, and Skype as potential platforms, although they do mention that this is not a total list. They also mention some platforms that should not be used, like Facebook Live, Twitch, and TikTok. So generally speaking, if the platform is designed primarily for broadcast or one too many communications, it is not a viable telemedicine platform under the discretionary notice. So overall, this relaxation of privacy rules is sure to be a temporary measure. And once a pandemic is over, programs are going to need to adjust back to their care in a more secure environment. We are also seeing some concerns raised over high volume video service providers in relationship to security and privacy. Some of these issues are related to users not understanding the security tools built into the products they're using, or perhaps organizations are not establishing effective procedures and controls for video conferencing. Other issues point to a deeper problem in the way some of these video providers handle their data. Regardless, we are seeing growing pains as organizations, vendors, and consumers deal with the new ways of seeking and delivering care. Now, the next thing we want to talk to you about is our recent assessment of web-based video platforms, which is also a key component of decision-making when choosing telehealth as a clinical option, option for delivery of care. In the next short video, we will provide you with a glimpse into some of our results. And then afterwards, Jordan will talk about how we conducted the assessment and we'll share some of the key video platform space. TTAC recently conducted some network stress testing of several video platforms. We streamed a standardized test recording over a network with varying levels of simulated degradation, including low bandwidth, delay, and packet loss. We then recorded the resulting video and audio at the receiving end. In the following video, you will see comparison views of eight video platforms recorded at a network speed of 512 kilobits per second. The recordings are synchronized to the source video and audio in the center of the screen. Following this, you will see a brief labeled clip of recorded test footage for each platform. Additional test footage and other related content will be published in the coming weeks. It takes a lot of help to finish these. Mark the spot with a sign painted red. Take two shares as a fair profit. The fur of cats goes by many names. North winds bring colds and fevers. He asks no person to vouch for him. Go now and come here later. A sash of gold silk will trim her dress. Soap can wash most dirt away. That move means the game is over. It takes a lot of help to finish these. Mark the spot with a sign painted red. Take two shares as a fair profit. The fur of cats goes by many names. North winds bring colds and fevers. He asks no person to vouch for him. Go now and come here later. Soap can wash most dirt away. That move means the game is over.
Okay, Jordan. Thanks, Doris. So, so that video, and we're, we're, we kind of led with the video just so you can kind of see what we did. And then I want to explain a little bit about what you just saw, how we conducted the assessment, and kind of what does it mean. So um, let's talk a little bit about bandwidth. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about some of the network speeds that you can experience. And I wanted to provide a little bit of a frame of reference so that we can kind of have something in our head that we're familiar with so that when we're talking about you know, 100 megabits per second versus um, uh, one megabit per second versus 512 kilobits per second, you, we have a frame of reference for what we're talking about. So I put this in terms that I think everybody can kind of relate to, um, Netflix. So if we're looking at your standard uh, definition stream of Netflix, how much speed, how much bandwidth does it take, does it consume to watch a standard video? So the speed that is uh, indicated by Netflix for standard definition is three megabits per second. So if you're watching something at your home um, on a standard definition television, three megabits per second is about the speed that we can expect um, for your downloads. If you're doing high definition, that goes up to about five megabits per second. So with that kind of frame of reference, we can talk a little bit about um, what we did here. And, and what we're doing is uh, this assessment was a, was a little bit of a stress test of different video platforms um, with artificially constrained bandwidth. And what we, what we did was we had a very fast network, 100 megabits per second. That's an organizational level broadband speed network. Um, and we took that network and we tapped into it with a network emulator. And what this let us do is it let us simulate a bunch of different um, parameters. The first and main thing that it let us simulate was speed. So we could check, um, uh, we could uh, either dial down or, or speed up the speed that we uh, were using all the way up to that 100 megabits per second, all the way down to 256 kilobits per second, which is a quarter of a megabit per second. So um, that network emulator allowed us to do that. It also allowed us to introduce some artifacts into the system. So we uh, connected to this emulator, we have two video endpoints, a patient video endpoint and a provider endpoint. And what we did was we took the Harvard sentences that you just heard uh, Garrett delivering there. Um, it's a 60 second Harvard clip and those are designed so that um, they're uh, kind of nonsense words. They don't make any sense when we, we line them all up, but they're all um, grammatically correct. Um, they all have proper diction um, so that it gives us a really good frame of reference. And we made a recording of that 60 second clip and we used a, another laptop to uh, basically play that recording through the patient side, run through the network emulator, and then we recorded it at the provider side. Um, and so that let us simulate a bunch of different network conditions and really see what the impact was. So our criteria for this assessment was connectivity, video quality, we looked at audio quality, and then we, um, at a kind of a high level, we looked at uh, just some of the usability and overall experience that we had with some of these different platforms. And next slide there, Doris. So we looked at eight uh, pretty common video platforms, as you can see there. Um, uh, the platforms that we looked at were either web-based or desktop, but we also looked at mobile platforms. Um, and we looked at them at a, a variety of different speeds. And let's break this down a little bit. We already established that 100 megabits per second was kind of what you can expect to get in a uh, organizational broadband speed type of environment. Uh, this is a, a very a, a fast network connection um, and should meet any demands that we have. Um, we also uh, simulated one megabit per second, which is um, slower than most platforms want, but um, it simulates what we might see at, at, at a okay, but not great network. Um, 512 kilobits per second is a good uh, analog for a very rural location, um, someplace that has very limited connectivity. Um, 384 kilobits per second is a good estimation for what we might see over a satellite. Um, and then 256 kilobits per second was really the torture test for these platforms. Um, these platforms are not really designed to run at that speed and we, we were trying to see if they would um, and see what we, kind of results we got at that speed. Um, our test sets were the different speeds and then we also applied some different network parameters. We looked at clean networks with um, um, basically just the bandwidth with no other artifacting in the network. We also looked at sat what we simulated a satellite by adding delay uh, to the signal. So um, whenever a packet would be sent from one computer to the other, any video information was sent, um, we would hold that uh, information for 600 milliseconds, 
before we sent it. And that simulates the delay it takes for a signal to um, go from the Earth up to a satellite back to the Earth. Um, in addition to that, uh, we simulated what a, a saturated satellite or a satellite that has a lot of connections that's having a hard time keeping up with the speed. So we added some variability to the amount of delay. So the delay ran anywhere from 600 milliseconds to 700 milliseconds. Um, and then uh, we asked, added some packet loss. So um, what happens if we start to lose information as we're sending it back and forth to the satellite? And our, our final test said was it just a, a really poor network. So 200 milliseconds of variable delay. So it just, the packets would be held for uh, anywhere from zero milliseconds to 200 milliseconds, and then 20% packet loss, which is a, a, a large amount of packet loss. Because we wanted to see what happens if you're on a very congested network and the packets just aren't getting through. What impact does that have on your video, your audio, and, and other quality? So you can see um, that the test that we played for you was at 512 kilobits per second, which is a nice um, uh, low bandwidth for these to perform at. And most of them perform pretty well. The audio was good. Um, the video was, was good, but a little bit jerky. And th this kind of leads us into some of our uh, results here and so some of the, the trends that we can see. So what are the challenges? of using a video platform with constrained bandwidth. Well, one of the big challenges, especially for web-based platforms, platforms that you go to a website, you log in, um, you're signing in, things like that, actually getting the call to connect can be a big challenge. Uh, so we see, saw that anywhere from um, 30 seconds to a minute could pass by from the point where a participant clicked join to where the call actually connected. Um, and that's not necessarily transmitting video, that's just navigating the connection, making sure both participants are there and ready. Um, and the more interaction you had on a, a web uh, portal or front end, the, the worse that could be. Um, we also saw that poor quality networks were really problematic. So any kind of packet loss or delay were really impactful to the performance that we saw. So we, we saw a lot of platforms that would run at a low bandwidth, even as low as 256 kilobits per second on a clean network. But as soon as we introduced packet loss or delay, we saw much more problematic, uh, uh, much more problematic audio and video experience. And the last big challenge that we saw was around clientless and mobile solutions. So as Doris was mentioning, one of the trends that we're seeing is uh, we, we see a lot of organizations that are wanting to engage with their patients in a really simple way. So I send you a link, you click the link and you join. Um, or uh, you go to a website and you just are joined and there's no software you need to download. We call those clientless solutions um, because there's no software being downloaded on um, one or the other the side. Uh, clientless solutions were, had a hard time dealing with low bandwidth and a very hard time dealing with packet loss and delay versus client-based solutions where maybe you download something to your computer, you install a program and that, that software is running through a program. Um, mobile also experienced uh, uh, much more uh, uh, problematic connections over low bandwidth and then again as we introduced packet loss and delay that really impacted the video and audio quality. So what does that look like when we begin to impact that video and audio quality? Well, most of these platforms, the first strategy that they'll use uh, is that they'll prioritize the audio, which means that when you're on a poor network connection with most of these platforms, they're automatically looking at with the amount of throughput that they have and, and they're, they're divvying up the amount of bandwidth based between the audio and the video. And they will generally, almost all the platforms will prioritize the audio um, and keep the audio as clear as possible for as long as possible before it begins to degrade. Um, what that means is that you will have a worse video experience but a better audio experience. And almost all platforms would do this. They would do this in one of two ways. Uh, either they would drop the frames, which means that um, instead of sending out a, a lot of pictures that would, you know, moving pictures that we would see, they would send out fewer pictures. So that means that the image is more jerky and you see, um, you see less of a smooth experience or they would reduce the resolution. And what that means is that the image would just be more blurry, more pixelated. Um, you may get as many frames, so it might be a smoother image, but it would be blurrier and uh, maybe a little harder to see what was going on. And that's kind of the main strategy they have, is they either will drop frames and send fewer video uh, packets out, or they will reduce the uh, resolution so that the, the video they're sending out takes less bandwidth. The other strategy that they, a lot of these platforms use is to have some sort of client solution. So if you're trying to connect over a low bandwidth area, um, you may need to download something. You may need to have your patients install an app on their mobile device, 
or you may need to uh, install a client on a laptop computer um, so that you log into the client instead of just engaging through a web-based browser. Um, and apps and desktop-based solutions tend to perform on average better than um, uh, mobile apps or mobile clients and then or uh, clientless solutions. So in terms of general trends, uh, when we ran them on unrestricted networks, one of the things that we found is most of these platforms want to use up to three megabits per second um, uh, downloads and about, uh, up to two megabits per second upload. That was the average for all platform uses. So that puts it kind of in line with what we see with um, streaming a Netflix movie to your house in standard definition. So that's the amount of bandwidth that most of these platforms are using. Next slide. So this brings us to kind of a conversation about broadband. Um, so what, what, what have we seen um, in terms of trends for broadband in general? And then what have we seen uh, in terms of broadband for rural communities? So um, the difference in uh, traffic increase pre-COVID and post-COVID is a difference of about 30%. There's about 30% more traffic um, in general um, pre-COVID versus post-COVID. Uh, we've seen some speed decreases in some regions um, across, the, uh, across the country, um, but the biggest impact that we're seeing, and, and you'll hear this described as the digital divide, you'll hear this described in a lot of different ways, is rural America and rural communities are still very far behind in getting access to speed, uh, broadband speed uh, connectivity. So, um, So, and it really is a primary concern for U.S. connectivity is the 2018 FCC broadband report indicated that 24 million Americans will still lack access to broadband speed internet. But um, almost more telling, 80% of that 24 million Americans are rural or tribal. Um, and as we've seen in the COVID um, crisis, it's important not only for healthcare, but for education, for uh, social well-being, access to broadband speed internet is it becoming more and more of an important issue and it becoming more and more integral to how we kind of live our lives. So next we want to talk um, about video conferencing hardware and I'm going to pass this back to Doris. Thank you, Jordan. <clears throat> so, you know, we talked about your platform. We talked about your speed. Now let's talk a little bit about the medical peripheral equipment that people will use in delivering telehealth. So video conferencing is by far the most common way telemedicine care is delivered, whether directly to the patient in the home or in a local clinic setting, they are using live video solutions like the ones that we're going to talk with you about today. And they are a very useful tool in the, in the delivery of virtual healthcare. So some of the major changes in video conferencing that we've seen over the last last five years has been the movement towards cloud-based video conferencing platforms. As video usage has moved towards low-cost laptops or desktop platforms, then the peripherals are also being used that provide audio and video for these visits that they have become USB plug-and-play camera and audio solutions. For our demonstration today, we wanted to show you what the various web-based video conferencing endpoints look like to the end user. So pay particular attention to the field of view, the color accuracy, and the overall clarity of the audio and video solutions. So with regards to video conferencing cameras and audio, our greatest tool for assessing video and quality is our own eyes and ears. So we want to give you a quick demonstration of three different video Audio, video and audio integrated solutions so that you can get a chance to hear and see some of the features for yourself. I will briefly introduce each platform and then Jordan will demonstrate the technology. So the first one that we are going to demonstrate for you is a Logitech Meetup. The Logitech Meetup is an all-in-one USB plug-and-play video camera that also has built-in pan tilt zoom functionality, speakers, and a microphone. It also supports an extension microphone puck that can be used to capture audio from the center of the room. 
So um, at this point, Jordan, I am going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Doris. So uh, here we have a demonstration of the audio and video capabilities of the Logitech Meetup. So you can watch as I'm actually able to pan the camera across the room here. Um, you can get a note of the, the kind of the field of view of the camera. Um, this device is kind of unique in that it actually has a mechanical pan tilt zoom functionality. So there's actually a motor driving the lens moving around. So we can pan up, we can pan down, and we can pan left and right. It has digital zoom, which means that it's um, reducing the resolution of the image as we kind of zoom in. But we're able to zoom in um, and get a better view of my face here. Um, and there's some preset support that it has as well. So we're able to um, hit a button and um, find some common uh, angles so that we can kind of see. And this gives you an idea of the full view of the camera. It comes with a speaker puck that will plug in so that you could actually run that out to the middle of a uh, table uh, in a room. Um, and these sorts of technologies that we're looking at, um, uh, one of the key uh, search terms that you may want to look at as you're kind of doing your own assessment is huddle space. A lot of these are referred to as huddle cameras or huddle space. I um, mean, they're designed for small um, clinic environments or small conference room environments where you have maybe a couple of speakers and you want to connect to a larger screen or you want to connect to a laptop and be able to transmit the information. Back to you, Doris. Okay, thanks, Jordan. So now the second system that we want to share with you is a Poly Studio. It uses a large digital sensor to capture a wide field of view, and it also allows you to pan with a digital image. Like the Meetup, it has a built-in microphone and speakers, and it is able to support extension microphones. Now Jordan is going to demonstrate the Poly Studio. So here we have the Poly Studio, and the Poly Studio is similar to the Logitech Meetup, kind of in form factor, um, but it has some key differences. Um, and it uses a large digital sensor to capture a kind of a wide field of view of what's going on in the room. And then from there, we can zoom into the image and pan digitally uh, kind of across the room. So like we did with the Meetup, I can walk over here and we can pan across the image. Unlike the Meetup, it's not using a mechanical pan tilt zoom, it's using a digital uh, pan. So it's uh, all of the movement of the camera is actually just the digital frame moving within that large digital image. Um, this also features a microphone puck that can be deployed to the center of a room so you can pick up audio in a room sized, uh, uh, in a medium to, to large clinic space or a medium conference room size. It has presets like we saw for the um, uh, Logitech Meetup. One of the other things that this device does is active speaker tracking. So as I uh, hit the active speaker tracking, it's able to frame in on my voice. If I move over here and continue to talk, the microphone will pick up my voice um, and it will reframe the image as best as it can um, to include the speaker. And again, as I move over to this side, this technology, it takes a second for it to track, but it eventually it should find me in the room and then reframe. Um, so th this sort of technology um, is becoming um, more and more accessible. Um, and this is all USB plug and place. We're actually able, we're running this through a laptop. We're able to take this in, plug it right into a laptop and get that functionality, uh, boardroom kind of level functionality from a USB plug and play type of device. Back to you, Doris. Thanks, Jordan. So we are, we are seeing a lot of solutions that combine the audio and unique video capabilities in one, one unique system. And the Meeting Owl provides a 360 view and robust audio. Jordan was talking about cameras that are used for huddled spaces, and this one is definitely one that's used for that. This one is designed to use in the middle of a room on a table so you have a group of speakers around it so that um, the camera can automatically focus and slice the image to show who is speaking. So now Jordan will demonstrate this one for us. Thank you, Doris. So it may take just a second for the video to pop up here. Um, so what we have here is we have the meeting room owl. And um, the Meeting Room Owl is unique in that it uses a 360-degree uh, lens on top of the camera to provide a full room view. So if you see here, um, up at the top of the screen, you see that full 
360 degree. And I'm, as I move my finger around the top of the camera, you can see as it moves in the frame. So what the camera is actually doing inside of the camera is it has that 360 degree view. And based on where it's hearing the speakers in the room, it will actually slice that view uh, to include the speakers, a little bit like we saw with the poly. Um, so as I move around the room, we can talk and continue to talk to the owl, and eventually it should reframe the picture based on the speakers that it hears in the room. An additional feature that this particular device has is that it's able to take multiple speakers. So if this was sitting in a table and we had a group of speakers around this camera, um, it would actually take the image and slice it um, into different parts. So we would actually get that Brady Bunch effect where we could have three or even four speakers sliced up um, in, in the image so that you'd be able to see them all at once. One of the challenges that we see with cameras like this that are designed to sit in the middle of a group of speakers is um, eye contact. So right now I'm looking at the sensor for the camera, but if um, the, the there's a television on the wall and I'm looking at that, the camera's not located where the television is, so we lose kind of the illusion of eye contact. But for group uh, sessions where you want to include multiple participants in one location and connecting to a, one participant in a different location, solutions like this where you're able to see everyone, everyone's able to uh, communicate through a single central device uh, can make a lot of sense. Back to you, Doris. Thanks, Jordan. So now what we wanted to do is just give you a, a snapshot of the three cameras that Jordan shared with you. They were all taken in the same place at the same time using the same platform. So it just gives you a little bit more of a visual of the three cameras, cameras that we just shared with you. Now the next thing that we wanted to talk about with you the, of the medical peripheral equipment is the exam cameras. So the USB exam camera provides a way for the far side provider to get a closer view of their patients. These cameras are designed to function like a webcam, so you can pull up the exam cam view with simply switching the camera setting on your video software. Many cameras will have interchangeable lenses and so that you can provide other functionality like otoscope and dermatology imaging. Some of these cameras also have built-in storage so that you can capture the view for a later viewing or transmission. Other devices only stream, but may have the ability to pause on the view, pause on the screen. There are multiple devices from numerous manufacturers on the market, and the cost for these devices can range from a couple of hundred dollars to several thousand dollars. So Jordan will demonstrate the layout and features of these three devices, and you will also see a recording demonstrating some of the functionality of the different cameras. Um, so back to you, Jordan. Thanks, Doris. So here on the table, we have the DE605 made by Firefly. So this, is, uh, this, uh, this device demonstrates this trend that we're seeing um, for a lower cost, um, kind of single purpose exam cam, or um, we're seeing otoscopes and we're seeing other kind of devices that are, they kind of have one purpose and they're designed to be low cost and, and to get them out into the field. Um, the features on this particular device is it has a, a built-in manual focus wheel um, here. So you can see this thumb slider here at the top. It has a built-in polarization filter, and we'll, you'll see this actually demonstrated in the, uh, the demo video that we have. So as this rotates, it applies a polarization or removes a polarization filter. It has um, buttons on the device to adjust the brightness. There's also a camera capture button. Now you need to use the um, uh, embedded or the provided software from Firefly in order to do the capture. And most of the time, if you're running this through, um, say, a video call, um, that fun button's not going to have any functionality unless you have a particular software designed to to use that capture functionality. Um, so for most uh, most video platforms, that button um, it would be inactive. But it connects via standard USB. And like the rest of the exam cameras that we're gonna look at, it shows up as a webcam. So what you can do is you can plug in this device, switch from your room-based camera to an exam camera and stream that information across to the provider on the receiving side. Um, next, we're gonna have a, a quick video demonstrating the functions of the Firefly DE605.
In this demonstration, we will show the ability of the Firefly DE605 to capture images of test objects at a distance of about 36 inches or 3 feet from the camera lens. Note how the manual focus needs to be adjusted for objects to be seen clearly. Images taken from this distance are useful for visualizing the anatomic location of complaints and for assessing movement. In this demonstration, we will show the ability of the Firefly DE605 to capture images of test objects at a distance of about 12 to 18 inches from the camera lens. These sorts of views are useful for dermatology, neurological, and general exam purpose imaging. In this demonstration, we will show the ability of the Firefly DE605 to capture images of test objects at a distance of 3 to 4 inches from the camera lens. This view is useful for viewing details like eyes, rashes or lesions, interoral imaging, dermatology, neurological, and general exam. In this demonstration, we will show the ability of the Firefly DE605 to capture skin detail. Using the manual focus ring, we can adjust the image until the desired skin features are clear. As we turn the polarization ring, we can see as the shine and depth is removed from the image for better color detail. Turning the filter back returns the shine and depth of the original image. So now Jordan's going to talk about the Horus 3. Thanks, Doris. So next up on the table, we have the Horus 3 by JADMED. So this device gets into the uh, space we call multi-exam cameras. And the reason it's called a multi-exam camera is because it has interchangeable tips that allows you to perform different sorts of exams with this device. So equipped, we have the general exam lens, but we can also attach an otoscope lens um, and so that we can take otoscopy images as well. Um, images are focused on this device using the manual focus wheel located on the underside. It has a built-in light source that can be used to uh, change the variable uh, light and that the, the variation in the light will really depend on which otoscope or exam lens that you have. Um, it has a built-in touch screen that not only um, provides a guide for framing your image, so you will see a picture of what the camera is actually seeing, um, but it also allows you to adjust um, menu settings and um, uh, onboard device settings. You connect the device via a locking USB cable and this is what you use to stream both the image, um, it provides power for the device, and then you can actually connect this device and download still images captured on this device to a PC. Pricing for this uh, unit for both lenses is about $5,000 compared to the uh, DE605 that we just saw, which is about $500. So you can see as we add multi uh, functionality, we're uh, also adding on additional costs. 
this device is primarily designed as both a live streaming camera so that it can stream out live things over say a video call and also a store and forward device that can actually capture store images on the device those images can be downloaded later and added to an EHR or sent to a provider for consultation. Next we're going to have a brief video showing some of the capabilities of the JetMed. And so are we? Uh, we need to go back. There we go. In this demonstration, we'll show the ability of the Horus 3 to capture images of test objects at a distance of about 36 inches or 3 feet from the camera lens. Note how the manual focus needs to be adjusted to focus on the test objects. Images taken from this distance are useful for visualizing anatomic locations of complaints and for assessing movement. In this demonstration, we will show the ability of the Horus 3 to capture images of test objects at a distance of about 12 to 18 inches from the camera lens. This view is useful for dermatology, neurological, and general exam purpose imaging. In this demonstration, we will show the ability of the Horus 3 to capture images of test objects at a distance of about 3 to 4 inches. This view is useful for viewing details like eyes, rashes or lesions, interoral images, and dermatology, neurological, and general exam purposes. In this demonstration, we will show the ability of the Horus 3 to capture skin detail. Holding the camera about 4 inches away, we manually focus to acquire the desired skin features. At this point, we can take a still image that will pause the live feed and store an image to the device for closer observation. In this demonstration, we will show the ability of the Horus 3 to capture imagery of the tympanic membrane. After switching to the otoscope lens, we move the scope into the ear canal where we can see the tympanic membrane. Using the manual focus wheel, we can ensure that all structures are in focus. We can now take a still image to pause the live feed and store an image to the device for closer observation. So now the last camera that Jordan's going to talk to you about is the Total Exam 3. Jordan? Thanks, Doris. So the Total Exam 3 is also a multi-exam camera in that we can switch out the heads between an otoscope and a general exam. On the device itself, we have the ability to pause a live image. Let's see if we can get this in focus here. 
um, using this frame fr freeze frame button here. We also have the ability to vary the brightness of the LED light source and to do a manual white balance. Um, pricing for this device is about $7,500. It has a pivoting head so that we can actually get better otoscope views. Um, this does not have any internal storage. So unlike the GEDMED, we're not actually able to record images directly to the device and save them for later. This is designed for video streaming um, as a uh, exam camera, uh, as a USB uh, webcam. Um, and we'll go to the demonstration video now. In this demonstration, we will show the ability of the Total Exam 3 to capture images of test objects at a distance of about 36 inches or 3 feet from the camera lens. Note how the camera is able to automatically focus on the different objects. Images taken from this distance are useful for visualizing anatomic locations of complaints and for assessing movement. In this demonstration, we will show the ability of the Total Exam 3 to capture images of test objects at a distance. Oops, sorry about that, guys. I don't know what happened. In this demonstration, we will show the ability of the Total Exam 3 to capture images of test objects at a distance of about 36 inches or 3 feet from the camera lens. Note how the camera is able to automatically focus on the different objects. Images taken from this distance are useful for visualizing anatomic locations of complaints and for assessing movement. In this demonstration, we will show the ability of the Total Exam 3 to capture images of test objects at a distance of about 12 to 18 inches from the camera lens. These sorts of views are useful for dermatology, neurological, and general exam imaging. In this demonstration, we will show the ability of the Total Exam 3 to capture images of test objects at a distance of 3 to 4 inches from the camera lens. This view can be useful for viewing details like eyes, rashes or lesions, interoral images, dermatology, neurology, and general purposes. In this demonstration, we will show the ability of the Total Exam 3 to capture skin detail. First, we balance the camera on a piece of white paper to ensure color accuracy. Holding the camera about 4 inches away allows the autofocus to acquire the desired skin features. At this point, the freeze frame function for this device is useful in pausing the image for closer observation. In this demonstration, we will show the ability of the Total Exam 3 to capture imagery of the tympanic membrane. 
After switching to the otoscope lens, we are able to white balance the image on a piece of paper. Moving the scope into the ear canal, we can see the tympanic membrane. We can use the freeze frame function to pause the image for closer observation. So now the next technology that we want to share with you is, is, is the stethoscopes. So live stethoscopy can be used to listen to a patient's heart and lung sounds at a distance. Most stethoscopes will require separate software to transmit their sound to the far end user. Now often the stethoscopes will use technology, the software from a number of different developers. So it's really important for you to take a look at a variety of software solutions before making a selection. Most stethoscopes will connect via a PC computer using USB, Bluetooth, or microphone jack connectors. We've also seen a rise in stethoscopes that are connecting directly to mobile devices, turning those devices into a mobile stethoscope platform. There has also been a trend to having a single lead ECG embedded into the stethoscope chest piece. So now Jordan is going to share with you uh, three different stethoscopes that are currently out on the market. Jordan, back to you. Thanks, Doris. So th the stethoscopes we're going to look at today um, really demonstrate the different connection models that we have. So this is the GEDMED Omnisteth. Um, this is a fairly new device out on the market. Um, it has interchangeable pediatric and adult heads. Um, you can filter on the device and what uh, in terms of uh, connection for telemedicine, it uh, connects via uh, a headphone jack, and then you can actually run that into a computer and run that audio out um, through a uh, stethoscope software. This Lipman 3200 is a really common device that we see out on the market, and this is a Bluetooth device. So this connects to a laptop or a, a another device via Bluetooth connection um, and uses that to stream the signal so that we can transmit it. This Echo um, actually uses a tablet, a phone, um, or some other mobile device as its platform for sending. So again, it connects via uh, a, um, Bluetooth, but it connects through a mobile app. Um, and this is also a device that has a built-in one lead ECG. You can do volume controls and filtering from the device, uh, but this is designed to be used with a, mobile, um, with a mobile device like an iPad or an iPhone or an Android device. Back to you, Doris. All right, thank you, Jordan. So now what we want to share with you is mobile, devi mobile devices. So mHealth has seen a rapid increase in both the quality and quantity of mobile health devices that are entering in the telemedicine market. These devices can support a variety of workflows, but most of them will share some key features. Generally, they'll connect to a smart device like a phone or a tablet, and they can be accessible through an app on that device and they may or may not support peripheral medical devices and the medical information collected by these devices is usually stored in a centralized server location or the cloud so now in the following overview demonstration jordan is going to share with you a few examples of mobile health technology So the devices we have for you here really kind of demonstrate the breadth of what we kind of see in a mobile health device. So it can be anywhere from a dermatoscope like this that we can use to uh, image the skin that connects to a smartphone, um, or it can be something like uh, the Tidal Care that's designed to go into the patient home, um, be paired to a mobile device, um, have peripherals that attach to it, um, and then stream that information to a provider. Or um, it can be something that has a more uh, specified function like this uh, butterfly ultrasound. So this device is designed to be used with a, an iPhone or a tablet, um, connects via this lightning connector like you would see on your chargers for many of your eye devices. Um, and so this allows us to actually get ultrasound functionality with a variety of different modes um, and a variety of different sens sensitivities right from a mobile device. Um, We've got a, a brief video demonstrating um, the butter, butterfly IQ in action.
This is a demonstration of the Butterfly Mobile ultrasound. The ultrasound footage was recorded from inside the Butterfly app on an iPad. Using the vascular access preset and the color Doppler setting, we are able to visualize arteries and veins within a subject's forearms. This demonstration shows that mobile tablets are becoming robust telemedicine platforms able to support a variety of peripherals and workflows. So now we just have some final thoughts that we want to share with you before we get to the Q&A section. Technology should always support the use case. It's really important that you look at the technology and you, first of all, you decide what you want to do, and then you start looking for the technology to provide this, the services that you want. It's also real important for you to try the equipment before you buy it. Hands-on is vital, vitally important for you to determine whether or not this equipment fits your need. Now we've sh shared with you several cameras, several stethoscopes, several different devices, but each person has a, you know, their own unique idea about what they need. So it's real important for you to, to try all the equipment before you buy it. Otherwise, it's just gonna end up in a drawer somewhere. The other thing that's real important that you make sure that your clinicians, your administrative team, and your technical team all have, have some say in what it is that you're going to buy. Because if any one of those three teams is not on board with the decisions that you make, then it's not gonna work. So you need to make sure that all of, all of, your, all of the teams that are going to be buying into the use of this technology are on board before you purchase it. And just some final, final thoughts with regards to COVID-19. As we talked earlier, we're seeing a lot more technology going into the home. We're providing home telehealth for whatever the reasons are that the patient cannot come into the clinic. So we are also using that patient's technology in their home environment. We're using their consumer grade broad broadband. Jordan talked a little bit about that. We're using their own tablets or their cell phones or their laptops. So it's real important that we take the time to work with that patient on the front end so that we don't have problems on the back end when we're providing that service. We may want to trial with that patient before we actually do that telemedicine encounter or we may have a set, you know, a backup plan. So if something happens in that, in that video conference and the video goes down for whatever reason, then you pick up a phone and you finish the, the clinical encounter. So planning on the front end will help mitigate a lot of problems on the back end. So basically plan before the crisis, right? And then finally, just a re reminder of the connectivity and the broadband and um, sometimes that we need to use a lower broad, a lower bandwidth solution to fit the need of the patient because of where they live and the services that they are needing. And so um, at the very end here, TTAC would like to thank you for giving us the opportunity to share with you today the technologies that we had. You can contact us at any time. This is our contact information. This is our website. We have a lot of technology toolkits on our website that you can access, and you can also give us a call. And now we'd like to thank you for joining us and open it up to question Q&A. All right, thank you, Doris, and thank you, Jordan, for the amazing presentation. That was incredibly useful, and I know I'm going to be referring back to it over the next several months to pick up more information that I might have missed while attending. Just wanted to remind everybody that this session is recorded, and it will be available probably by Friday, if not sooner. The previous presentations have all been recorded and are up on our website, and uh, join us for our next presentation in the series, which will be on September 9th on Bedside to Website, Optimizing the Telehealth Experience. I'm going to turn this over to Rebecca to uh, facilitate the Q&A session. Thanks again. 
Thanks, Thank Kathy. You. Thanks, Doris and Jordan. All right, so we have two questions in the Q&A. So um, if anybody does have any burning questions, go ahead and type them in. Um, so the first question is, which integrated video platforms allow for group visits through a patient portal or maybe that are embedded into an EMR or an EHR? So that's like four questions in one. Um, I think we should break it down uh, kind of according to uh, probably easiest to, to most challenging. So um, the first question is uh, most of these platforms, or first part of the answer is most of these platforms will support group sessions. So you can connect multiple participants, um, you can send out group invites. Um, so most video platforms will allow you to connect with more than one um, participant. So you can do that um, using the base functionality for a lot of these. Moving on to another level of complexity, um, different EMR support, different video platforms. Um, what you will hear is that, you know, uh, if you talk to a video platform, they will say, yes, we can integrate with your EHR. Um, so the, the questions is, um, when, you're, when you're talking about that level of integration, is what is the depth and what is the breadth? So the, the, the depth of the integration is like, are they able to pull information from your patients? Are they able to pull scheduling information? Um, are they adding a lot of features that are gonna be clinically significant to your video platform? Or is it just a button that you push inside of a patient chart and it launches a video call? Um, so you wanna understand how deep it goes and then you wanna understand um, who has access to that? So yeah, is it available through a patient portal? And, and the answer is um, a lot of platforms, uh, a, a lot of your EMRs will support kind of one key video platform um, that they have a lot of built-in integration for. Um, so your Epic might work with one platform and uh, Cerner might work well with another platform that they've done a lot of integration with previously. But that doesn't mean that you can't have an, uh, a video platform integrated with your EHR, pulling information about patients or uh, pulling in room information and, and putting it in the chart or summaries, um, putting out reports and things like that. But um, you'll need to talk to the particular video, uh, your, your EHR, uh, your EHR vendor and the video platform to figure out what kind of uh, coordination they are able to do. Um, a, a lot of these platforms, especially a lot of these uh, telemedicine specific platforms, um, are kind of designed to be their own patient portals. So they want you to log in and be part of their environment um, and have you connect through there. And then they'll just send a report back to your EMR, EHR. And uh, in a lot of ways, that's the limit of their functionality in terms of integration with the EHR. So um, if EHR functionality is something that you want, you really want to look at it. And I would start with your EMR, your EHR first. So don't start with the video platform. Start with your EMR, your EHR, and find out which video platforms they kind of support natively. Um, and that will give you the greatest level of kind of built-in, baked-in functionality to start with. That was way more complicated than I thought it was going to be. Okay, um, <laughs> so the next question is, what telehealth platforms allow for multi-language access? And how do these platforms allow for the integration of medical interpreters? Yeah, so um, this is also ha has some depth to it as well. So you can, in, uh, you can engage an interpreter with pretty much any video platform. Um, you know, if you have uh, an interpret interpretation service, um, if you have access to uh, a, a service like that, you can bring in an interpreter and have them as a third participant in a call. Um, there are uh, telemedicine platforms that have those services integrated into their offerings. Um, and it's either you can buy that as an add-on service or you can integrate with maybe a service that you already have um, and then when you're scheduling, you can indicate that you need an interpreter and that functionality can happen at scheduling. Um, but it, it does vary, um, kind of like what we were talking with EHR integration. So there's a, a wide variety of services out there, uh, but at, at the end of the day, if you have an interpretation service or a language service, um, you can um, coordinate with that resource and bring them into the call that you were going to have with the patient already. 
And in case anybody's wondering, the reason that no business names are mentioned is because the resource centers are vendor agnostic and we cannot look like we're supporting one vendor over another. However, I Googled multi-language telehealth platform and got quite a few. So um, I would suggest you Google that. <laughs> um, okay, next question. Is there any way for a breakdown of each platform and the components they offer, for example, integration, scheduling, portals, et cetera? So that's a really good, uh, Doris, why don't, why don't, why don't you um, kind of answer this one? It's kind of, yeah. So it is something that we have been working on and we are just about ready to put it up on our website. We have done, uh, you know, the video that we showed you of the eight platforms. We've done a, a deep dive on 14 different telehealth platforms that talks about their functionality, um, Oh, you know, what they use for broadband capability, what their platform base is. And we just sent that information to our web developer today. We should have that information on our website within the next two weeks. So that is the, mo the majority of the big named ones that you would, you, when you look at it, you're going to go, oh yeah, I've heard of them, I've heard of them. Now, if you have someone that you're looking at that isn't on our website, go ahead and give us a call and we will do some research for you. But I would say by the end of next week, we have a comparative list of 14 video platforms that gives you that information. The other thing we're going to do, and we haven't got it done yet, is Jordan, as Jordan talked about those videos, he has done various speeds of those videos and we're in the process of scrubbing, scrubbing the information on those and they will all also be up on our website so you'll be able to see, since we're using Zoom, we'll, we'll just say Zoom, you'll be able to see Zoom at the speed of 250K, um, 500, what were the other speeds, Jordan? 512, one megabit per second. You'll be able to, we, we um, in, in, had some satellite tests so you could simulate kind of what does this look like if we had a satellite connection, things like that. So for, for all of the, we'll, we'll provide the test footage so that you can kind of see um, for your own eyes, what do these platforms actually look like at these speeds? Now, we should say that our test is our test. It was kind of a, a test in time. Some of these platforms have changed since we tested them a little bit. Um, so, you know, any testing that we do is kind of a one-time thing, but it should give a, a hopefully a good frame of reference for, for you to assess with your eyes and your ears kind of what you're seeing. All right, so that's the last question we have in our chat. So thank you guys so, so very much for the presentation. We really appreciate it. And um, we hope those of you that are still with us are able to join us next week. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye.